Uh, first of all, uh, sorry about my appearance. I uh, nicked my face shaving this morning, so I've got a lovely Prussian dueling scar now. It's funny the amount of um, blood that can appear through just a little tiny nick that you didn't hardly feel. Uh, but there you are. It'll be gone in a few days. Um, the um, There's a phenomenon in um, British mass culture called monstering, uh, where the media, uh, generally the gutter press, goes after somebody, <laughs> uh, usually a politician, but it can be other people as well, where you basically sandbag this person. You make them, you isolate them and make them look really stupid or really bad, or you just uh, um, go out of your way, not necessarily to slander anybody, but to just really put a very negative limelight on them. Now, you sort of think, all right, well, that's freedom of press. You have the ability to do that. And, I, you know, there doesn't seem to be any uh, any remedy to it. Um, now, the way that it, it operates is um, you basically just, you know, you draw caricatures of people constantly. You draw, or you take photographs of them, you know, you just where you freeze frame and their face just happens to look like, like that or whatever. <clears throat> and um, you make them look bad. Now, you sort of think, all right, well, the public is going to see through that and they're not going to draw the appropriate conclusions. By and large, that's true. Um, by and large, the British public is <laughs> sophisticated and generally sees this as, ugh, that's just the gutter press again, isn't it? But it can make a 1 or 2% difference in a general election. It's not much, but that'll win you an election. That'll put you in number 10 downing for the next half decade or longer. <laughs> um, you don't really need to, in, to influence a lot of people when you have uh, a very close race. So monstering works. But of course it's presupposed upon the idea that um, there are people out there who really deserve to be monstered. Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're, you're plucking at the heartstrings, as it were, subconsciously. Who are the monsters? Who are the assholes? Who are the morons? Who are the incompetents? Who are the jerks in our society? And you're just exposing them for what you say they are. Now, <clears throat> that that's an interesting thing. This idea that there are people out there who are fundamentally deficient. Um... Because we, I think that it's fair to say that deep down we know that we're all deficient. Uh, but our justice system is based upon the notion that there are varying degrees of deficiency. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is, um, okay, on the surface of it, um, you, you go down to your local courthouse, and uh, I don't know how it works in the States, but here in Canada they have this fetish of at uh, provincial or Supreme Courts of various types of having a, the big statue of um, justice as a beautiful woman holding scales with a blindfold on. Well, that's all very nice, but we know darn well that justice is not blind. We're used to thinking along the lines of O.J. Simpson, you get to murder people and get away with it. Um, yes, there is that element in it, but there's also the element of um, mitigation. Okay. Uh, and it's always based upon guilt and victimhood. If I'm someone whom society identifies as a victim, okay, as fundamentally a victim, then I'm going to get off with a lighter sentence than someone whom society has identified as a monster. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that means that justice is not blind because it does depend on who's standing in, in the box, waiting for the judge to start his or her speech. Um, yes, you did rob the bank. Uh, yes, you did put lots of lives at risk. Uh, but because you were horribly abused throughout your childhood, and um, because you come from a group in society that we consider to have traditionally been disadvantaged, etc., then we will go easy on you. Um, now, believe it or not, I actually support that kind of uh, judicial thinking. I actually support it. I'm not, I'm not speaking out against it. I'm simply pointing to it as a phenomenon in our system, and I think that it is. Um, so, in a sense, <clears throat> this idea of guilt or innocence lies at the heart of our sense of right or wrong. 
when we judge some judge someone, there are mitigating factors. Um, for example, the, um, the 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 biggest case of that, of course, is uh, the Nuremberg defense. I was only following orders. Okay, now it's it's an interesting one. It's not as easy to crack as you might think. Um, I'm a soldier. I must obey, or else you know society can't function. Oh yeah, you tell me that I have that I that under certain circumstances I should disobey orders. Okay, what if I decide to overthrow the government? You know, uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to disobey my commanders. Uh, is that what you're telling me? Well, no. Uh, and I think that you know the the judgment at Nuremberg was a judgment more or less about the over uh, a judgment in favor of the ethics that we were going to accept as a society, rather than a judgment upon the actual perpetrators. I think that that was more or less just just sort of the precedent that we were now setting um, for all time. We're dealing with guilt-based ethics. We have found who the bad people are, or who are more bad um, than the norm, and uh, we're going to now deal with these people. Now, the interesting thing about that is it presupposes, A, that there are people who are <clears throat> fundamentally bad, and B, that we can identify these people. Now, um, the first one, fundamentally bad. Do we actually have to have the ability to tell whether or not somebody is fundamentally bad in order to throw them in the clink for 20 years or whatever? No. Did they do it or not? That's it. Did they do it or not? <laughs> like we say, okay, we as a society uh, do not condone murder. Therefore, he murdered somebody, throw him in jail for 20 years, or just flip through your criminal code and it says here, okay, uh, off with his head. Very simple. It's not that he's done, an, it's not that he's an evil person or anything, but the sort of, the way that we've opted to manage society simply says that, okay, regardless of whether or not this is anybody's fault, if we don't have this rule book, then we're going to have no rules at all. So it's better to have rules that are even nonsensical than no rules. Because in many ways, our rules are pretty nonsensical. Like, for example, take our decency laws or obscenity laws. All kinds of things that are completely and totally harmless are illegal. Okay, we, we know this, but something in the back of our heads, something Freudian, I guess, says that, uh, yes, uh, fondling myself in public is not a good thing, and I should be punished or at least restrained from doing so, even though I'm not harming anybody. Um, I would probably be the first one to have my skin crawl if I was sitting on a, on a bus and I saw the person across the aisle from me doing that. I'd go, ah, stop that. Why? I've been conditioned. Anyway... It's kind of a little aside there. <clears throat> but I'm just pointing out that our laws are kind of nonsensical to start with. Um, now, determining guilt, determining culpability, and the blindness of justice. Well, okay. Um, we say that, we're, that, that justice is blind, but no, we've already established that it depends on who is actually standing in the witness box, how blind justice is, because justice is not being blind by taking mitigating factors into consideration. Now... You have to ask yourself then, at that situation, okay, how do I become one of those people who gets uh, something of a, a let uh, in terms of how harshly I'm going to be judged by society? Well, I set myself up as a victim. That's how I do that. That's you know that's pa classic passive aggression. Um, I get a let. I'm not to be judged the same uh, you know to the to the same extent as other people because I'm a victim. I've got more sort of on the scales in terms of victimhood than the next person does. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm not saying that I disagree with this. I'm just saying this is where our justice system is not necessarily blind. Now, the interesting thing about that is, um, it, again, it, the fact that we're going to put anybody in prison because they're bad or they've done bad or that they, they've done something culpable or guilty or whatever, something sort of, you know, they, that they really not, they didn't just sort of break the rules in the rule book here. They didn't just say, okay, you committed this crime, so the book says this is your punishment, bailiff lock this guy up till his sentence is over and then let him out. That's the end of it. That's There's no no where, wiser where to for is about it. It's just uh, th this is what's happened. We throw him in jail. Now this might sound um, crazy to you, but there's plenty of societies that operate that way. Uh, plenty of them. And in fact, <clears throat> in many ways they insist that their system is less harsh than ours. Because not only do we um, do we um, judge people and throw them in jail, we hold them up in front of the entire society and we say, these people are guilty. These people are fundamentally dirty because of what they did. 
it's not enough to just throw the guy in jail for 40 years or whatever. We have to say, there's the dirty man. There's the dirty person. That guy in Chicago, or no, Cleveland, that locked all those women up in society is the latest version of this. He even said, look, I'm not an evil person, I'm sick. Um, you have every right to throw me in jail. I understand society has to protect itself. And I'm not saying that I agree with this, because again, he's just playing the guilt game, right? He's just saying, in a sense, I'm a victim of my own illness, therefore you should mitigate, therefore I should get a let. That's what his, his lawyer probably told him to do. This is your, the smartest thing that you can do under the circumstances is say that you did these things because you're a victim of something or other, because that's how our justice system works. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, <laughs> um, if you take guilt to its ultimate conclusion, and I think that it's been done here in the course of this discussion, we're all victims. We're all victims of existence itself. We're all off the hook, because again, I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask for anyone to create me. I didn't ask to uh, to be around. Nobody asked to, nobody asked me if I wanted to be pulled out of existence into this dreadful place. So I'm, I'm a victim. I'm off the hook. See, that's the thing about about guilt-based ethics. You can always mitigate it. You can mitigate everything because ultimately we're all victims, and it just becomes a scramble over who is the bigger victim. Um, it also um, has the nasty net effect of um, glossing over the fact that we're all perpetrators. Because it assumes that there is a point, again, when I'm standing in that that sort of model that I said, where I'm standing in front of two doors, one says damned if you do, the other one says damned if you don't, it, it presupposes that I have enough information at every single one of those m infinite number of doors in life to make a guilt-free decision. No, I do. we never have enough information to know what the repercussions of our actions are going to be. A butterfly effect. I might have actually precipitated World War III by drinking my coffee this morning. It's possible. I don't know. Okay, what do I do? Ball up? Say, all right, uh, well, oh, I, I wish I hadn't drank that coffee, because if I hadn't been so stupid and so selfish as to drink that coffee, uh, the chain of events that I set into motion by drinking that coffee resulted in, let's say, not even nuclear war. Let's say it resulted in the lingering death of humanity with a disease that artificially uh, lengthened our lives and artificially amplified our capacity to feel pain or whatever. And if I hadn't drank that cup of coffee this morning, none of that would have happened. Now, <laughs> that's, do I have to take that into consideration every time that I ever do anything? The butterfly effect? That's what, that's what, that's what guilt ultimately seems to imply. I don't see any way out of it. Um, because, again, if you're, if you're going to find somebody guilty, and again, this, that's, the, 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 the guilt thing seems to be a ne never-ending search for scapegoats as well, uh, for bad people. That's why you have CNN and, and things like that, is essentially what they're doing is they just flash the photograph of the bad guy on, uh, on the screen and they say, there, we caught another one, another bad guy, another thought criminal or whatever kind of heretic or scapegoat or whatever. Uh, another bad person has been plucked out and that proves that the rest of us are good. Now, I think that deep down we understand the stupidity of this because we're sort of saying on the one hand, anybody who actually does something bad can get a let by setting themselves up as victims. So we've now got a situation in which potentially we're all victims and potentially we're all perpetrators. Um, that is kind of an infinite regression that I think our society is grappling with right now. The, the, the situation that gets set up when you put guilt into your ethics. Can you imagine if we took guilt out of our ethics tomorrow? What would happen? Watch Judge Judy. It's all guilt in action. Uh, watch a political speech. It's all guilt in action. Anybody who is a leader for anything, it's all based on guilt and the presupposition that it's possible to identify victim from pert. And that uh, victims are people who shouldn't be judged to the same standard as perps. Um, Guilt-based ethics are sort of completely crazy, but I would say a guilt-based justice system is almost just as crazy. Again, I'm not saying that we take that out of the system. I'm merely pointing out that we have to see that for what it is, and we have to understand what the pratfalls of it are. 
um, if we push it to its logical conclusion. Um, ultimately, we're all perpetrators, and we are all victims. In that case, we either all go to jail or we all get out. <laughs> That's why I say that Gary's situation, his formula, has essentially abolished guilt. Um, we're all guilty of everything. <laughs> I drank my cup of coffee this morning, didn't I? I should have thought it through.